It is wonderful to see you, my friend. Frankie Benelli, how are you? Always great to see you, my brother. You too, man. I said, did the rain mess you up a little bit? But you're like, nah, the rain was fine. I like the rain. It's like being in Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> how many years you lived in L.A. now? Um, I I came out, the first time I came out was in 72. Uh, didn't get anything, uh, actually 75, and uh, didn't get much accomplished. Went back east, regrouped, and then came back out again. Um, but I've been here mostly since 1975. What brought you here in 72, just chasing chasing the dream as a musician? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, in the music business, there was only two places to, to do music, New York or L.A., and the weather was much better in L.A. if you're going to be couch surfing. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. You know, yeah. So you, when you came out in 72, nothing, no connections, no nothing, you just, just let me go out and see what I could find? Yeah, I came out, I came out um, and I packed very light, uh, but nothing was going on. When I came in 75, I came with my uh, 1969 Green Ludwig drum set, and I had taken the drum heads off and put all my clothes inside of it, and I had $300 to my name, and uh, I get to LAX, and I'm in the white zone, you know, no no parking, white zone, sitting on my cases trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And, uh, and a van from SIR uh, pass by and put on the brakes and the guy backed up and he gets out and he goes, Frankie? I said, Greg? And it was a guy that I knew that was now working for SIR and he goes, what you doing? And I told him. And he goes, all right, well, we'll store your drums at SIR or you can sleep on my couch. Wow. And it started from that. What was your fir- first paying gig as a drummer? My first paying gig as a drummer, I was 14 years old. I put a band together called The Pound of Flesh. This is in New York? Yeah, in, uh, in Astoria. Uh, Queens, and uh, we played a church social. We made $13 a piece. The first dollar to hit my hand, my right hand, I put in my pocket, and the other $12 I put in the left pocket. And then the next morning, I went to the five and dime, bought a cheap frame, and framed that first dollar. And I still have it sitting in my office in the same shitty frame. Wow. What was your first gig that you landed when you got to L.A.? Because uh, you did, you played on some things that I don't think a lot of people realize. Like you, it's you on Money Money, Billy Idol, right? Correct. Yeah, and Baby Talk. Okay, so you're Billy Idol, the, but and and also um, the Hughes Thrall album. Yeah, that's you on a bunch of that too, right? Yeah, but that came later. Uh, my my first the first time I was actually on a tour bus and went out on the road is Robert Fleischman, who had recently left as the vocalist for Germany. Right. Uh, for Journey, had gotten a uh, record deal with Arista. Uh, and he used all studio musicians for the record, but wanted to use, you know, live players. And I came and audition, and uh, and I was out with him uh, for that entire tour, which was uh, basically opening up for Van Halen. Uh, it might have been the Diver Down tour. Oh wow! So, so that was my first time, and then we came. That was a '79. What was that band called? Uh, um, Robert Fleischman, Perfect Stranger. Wow. Okay. And then, uh, and then I came back to LA, and uh, I went to see Quiet Riot at uh, at the Starwood, and I'm upstairs, you know, and I'm, I'm I've had quite a few drinks in me, and this guy comes up to me and he goes, "Are you Frankie Benelli?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "I'm Nick St. Nicholas from Steppenwolf. Call me tomorrow." And he gave me a piece of paper with his name and number, and I called him up, and uh, he told me to get, I think it was Live Wolf album and learn it, and I did. And, uh, and he called me up for a rehearsal and, and I went up to his house for rehearsal and we rehearsed, sounded great. And, uh, and he says, okay, you leave next week. We're leaving tomorrow. And I said, huh? He goes, yeah, we're going to fire a drummer on the road. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I didn't realize you played, you realized you played in Steppenwolf. Almost two years. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. to 80. Yeah. What were your thoughts? So you went to see Quiet Riot, obviously with Randy and the the original band, right? Early yeah, I'd on. get on the guest list, and everybody bought me drinks, so it was a no it was a no brainer. <laughs> what were you like? What were your thoughts seeing that version of the band? Uh, were you a fan? I imagine. Well, at this point, um, Kelly Garney was already out of the band. He wasn't playing bass anymore, and Rudy Sarza was playing bass. Now, Rudy and I had met in 1972 uh, because on November 17th, my local garage band a three-piece called ginger opened up for david bowie uh at pirates world for one show on the uh, ziggy stardust tour and unbeknownst to me rudy and his brother robert sarzo were out in the audience now the next day is uh is the 18th november 18th that was rudy's birthday so I went to this club called The Flying machine and then rudy went to the club called uh, fly machine and he comes up to me and 
the bass player and I look similar. So he thought I was the bass player and he's going on telling me, you know, how much he loved the drummer. And I just, I was just reeling it all in. And then when he was done, I put my hand out and I said, uh, by the way, I'm the drummer, Frankie Minnelli. <laughs> and he turned around and walked away. <laughs> That's how we met. One other thing about early history, I, I always wanted to ask you, Money Money by Billy Idol is to this day like a classic rock staple. It's played everywhere in every nightclub they play it and every everywhere. How did you uh how did it come to be that you cut the drums on that? I received the call. I to this day I don't know how Keith Forsey, um Billy's producer, um got my phone number. I think another producer recommended him to me um because after the fact he told me I heard that that uh, you're real professional, you learn the material, you cut fast and you leave. And I said, "Yeah, that's that's that's, that's pretty accurate." Um so I met Billy and we went to the Rainbow and had a couple of drinks and and we're discussing not even music, we're discussing films. That, that we both enjoyed. Uh, and the next day went into the studio and it took 45 minutes to get the drum sound, 30 minutes to cut the track. And they said, it was great. Can you do some more? And I said, I have time for one more because I was double booked. I was booked uh, to go into the studio with Roy Thomas Baker that evening uh, to cut production demos for J.C. Crowley, who used to be in Player. <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Was there ever a side of you that y there's all these drummers that are unbelievable session guys and they go in and they cut the track and you know sometimes you don't even know they're on the record and or even any musicians i mean it's a guy like steve lucas they're all these guys that are just the pros that go in they do it and they're very comfortable making a great living doing that mm -hmm. you know the hired guns behind the scenes sort of guys was it sounds like you could have very well went down that road if it hadn't been for joining quiet riot was that of interest to you or were you always a guy that wanted to really be out there on the stage and 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 be recognized well i enjoy both sides of it i i enjoy being in the studio under the microscope because it's it's very unforgiving um but i differ with a lot of studio um drummers whereas uh, a lot of studio drummers will learn the entire thing you know, from top to bottom, and they will play that the same way every time. Um, I will learn the entire song and all the signposts that need to be fixed. But what happens in between those spots, I leave it to spontaneity. Otherwise, it becomes sterile to me. Mm. So it's got to have a feel. It's got to have a pocket. It's got to have a groove. Otherwise, it just becomes mechanical. The other side of the coin is I love I love performing live because what you get back from the audience is what spurs you on, you know, to do your very best. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so you walk in here, and you give me this. I didn't want to open it until we were on the air, but you give me this very nice Christmas bag here with a bow on it. And I'm going to open this for the first time here. Frankie. Please do. Brought, now I just realized, and I missed it and I apologize for missing it was, I should be giving you a gift because it was your birthday the other day. That's okay. I've had plenty of gifts in my life. <laughs> so, well, happy belated to you. Thank you. Um, so this is from Japan. Yep. Oh, just what I need. The big chooch I am. You're giving me candy. Yeah, but look at, look at the flavors. Kit Kat. What is it? Kit, Kit Kat with Japanese lettering on it. Hold on. What is the flavor? I can't read uh, it. It's in Japanese. <laughs> let me see this one. Frankie ah. gave me a bag of candy. Just what I need, Frankie. I appreciate it, but I'm looking through this. Oh, wait, what is this? Kit, Kit Kat. It looks like green tea. Green tea Kit flavored. Kat? Yeah. Wow. And uh, this is... That might be sake flavored. Sake, wow! <laughs> or it looks like a like a cantaloupe. Oh yeah, that, that's the cantaloupe flavored. This one. is peach. Peach, yeah. Well, you got a whole bag. It's like Halloween all over again here, there man. You go. Thank you. These are for me. Those are all yours. Wow, you are you are too kind. These are really cool. Is that a thing in Japan? Like different flavored Kit Kats? Yeah, they're crazy about it. They have their own their own uh, stores and stands, and then they're also in in department stores, and they do um, certain flavors at a certain time of the year that you can't ever get again. Really? Yeah. My kids will love this too. There I'm going to take go. some of these home because they're all about stuff from other countries. There now you, you were just in Japan. So so let's get into it. So I ran into I was here a couple of weeks ago, and I ran into Chuck Wright, mm -hmm. right on outside of the whiskey on the sidewalk, and I had reached out to you when the news came out about your illness, mm -hmm. and I know you were dealing with a ton of stuff, but your voicemail was full, and I had texted you a couple of times. I texted Regine. I said, please let Frankie know I'm thinking of him. Anything I could do. I know how much you were dealing with when you made that announcement. Sure. I ran into Chuck on this on the sidewalk on Sunset, mm -hmm. and the first thing when I saw him, I said, 
how's Frankie? I tried to reach him. I haven't heard from him. I said, I know he's dealing with a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. And he said, oh, Frankie's going to Japan to play. <laughs> he, goes, we, he goes, we just played here at the Whiskey a couple nights ago and he played. Yeah. And now he's going to Japan to play with Mr. Jimmy doing his Zeppelin show. I go, wait a minute. Yeah. The same Frankie that just announced he's ill, you know, seriously ill. He goes, oh, yeah, he's still playing. He's playing great. He played in whiskey. He's going to Japan. He's going to Japan. Yeah. And I, that made me feel really good to know that you were feeling well enough to do all of that. But to talk about what you, you just came, obviously you brought me this candy. You just yeah. came from Japan mm -hmm. and you, you did a Zeppelin show there with the guitar player from Jason Bonham's band, right? right? Jimmy Sakurai with his band, uh, Mr. Jimmy. Um, and for the last few years, uh, I go over to Japan once or twice a year and do the Mr. Jimmy shows over there. Um, so the last one we did was the recreation, uh, three and a half hour recreation, the 1977 LA Forum show, top to bottom. And the amazing thing is the X Theater is technologically the most amazing place when it comes to acoustics so much so that my understanding is sony records goes there and plays masters for approval and uh and when we were doing sound check you know i went out in the audience and various spots and up into the balcony and it sounded exactly the same in every seat but the japanese are so um so technically perfect in, in what they do that the X theater has all these amazing state of the art led lights. Mm -hmm. But in 1977, uh, those didn't exist. So they brought in 275 park hands on scaffolds, just like Led Zeppelin did. And oh, the, wow. And the drum riser moved up to the front of the stage, uh, for the drum solo and concussion bombs and everything went off. And, uh, so we did that. And now I'm scheduled to go back uh, I'm playing a show with Choir Riot in uh, in the St. Louis area on the 27th of November. Then um, I go in for chemo round nine on December 3rd. December 16th, I leave for Tokyo. I return the, 20 the 22nd from Tokyo, and I leave the 29th um, for Michigan to play the last show of the year with Choir Riot. Wow. Amazing. Now we should tell people when you walked into the studio mm -hmm. just now, you as we speak, you are getting chemo. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, the way the chemo works now is you go into the hospital as I did yesterday morning, um, and from the time we walked in, checked in, checked out, it was almost six hours, uh, and and that's the first step of the chemo. Then as soon as that's done, they take that same chemo formula and they put it in a pump. And so I'm wearing this, you know, this fanny bag, not as a fashion statement. Right, Frank. He goes, "This isn't a fashion yeah. statement. It's actually doing something." Yeah, but if you can, if you can see here, here are the lines. That yeah. yellow fluid that you see going through the line, yeah, um, goes to a port that's in my chest here. Mm -hmm. And then this thing that looks like a vein mm -hmm. isn't a vein. That's an actual um, tube that mm -hmm. goes to an artery in my neck. And then another tube goes to my heart, um, and so the chemo is constantly being pumped through through my entire body, uh, through through my heart. It's using that as a propulsion. So I am now here doing your interview because I love you on chemo eight day two. Wow! How do you feel? Do, do you do you? I mean, everybody. Look, cancer has touched, if not anyone directly. There's not a person you can find, a family member, someone close, to a loved one or something. I've mm -hmm. certainly had it in my family and all that. And you hear people have differing feelings about how they feel. You seem really obviously there and you seem like you have a great, that same great energy and spirit mm -hmm. about you. How do you physically feel right now? Well, after previous to this, after doing seven rounds of chemo, the reason we stopped, we stopped at seven about two and a half months ago um, because I had gone down to 135 pounds and my oncologist felt that I was too weak to go on to the next level. Um, and during that period of time, I had two tubes that were inserted into my side because I had some fluid that was leaking from various areas into my abdominal cavity uh, that was being caused by the tumor in my pancreas and the tumor in my liver pushing on, on different organs. What that meant was that I couldn't eat any solid foods because the, the tumor was pushing down and wouldn't allow me to get any food into my stomach. Um, so I went down to 135 pounds. Um, what, were, what did you weigh? I, on April 17th, when I was diagnosed, I was, uh, I was a, um, a very healthy 
1977 John Bonham, 197 pounds. Okay. And went down to 135. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they tried to put a stent valve in, which would have made it possible for me to eat solid foods um, and for it to get into my stomach and the intestines and all of that. Um, And after three tries, they just couldn't do it. And so the doctor, when I came out of anesthesia from surgery, uh, you know, I said, so are we good? And he goes, no, we couldn't get past the blockage. And I said, am I going to have to be wearing this tube in this bag for the rest of my life? And he goes, yeah, it's likely. And I said, no, I I don't accept that. I'm going to stop treatment because this is a very poor quality of life. And he says, well, hold on. And he left and had a meeting with uh, with his surgeons. And he came back and he goes, we're going to try one more thing. And it was literally a Hail Mary play. Um, I had been to the hospital since nine in the morning that day going through through all of this. It's now six o'clock in the afternoon or six o'clock in the evening. They roll me back into surgery. And by 915, when I came out of uh, anesthesia, he says they were able to put the stent in. So in due course, the tube was removed and I've been able to start eating food. And do you have, now you you got to, ske- I mean, Going to Japan is not across the street. Yeah, and you're you got quiet riot gigs. You're going back to Japan. You've got a lot. Of, you you have now the energy and the stamina to do that. You have the energy and stamina to to, to play a full show, no problem. Yeah, it hasn't I mean, have impacted your playing or your your wind or anything. And, no, here's here's the strange thing. Like there's there's so many side effects that come along with chemo, and and side effects get added on to you um, as you do more chemotherapy. And the recovery time is a bit longer each time. The amazing thing is that right now I have no feeling in my fingertips and no feeling in my toes. And I sit behind the drums and everything works flawlessly. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know why I don't question it for fear that if I question right, it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But, but it's been great. No, you know, I did the whiskey show, which is, which is um, the one that I did a week after I went public with uh, right. the disease. And, uh, you know, Timing was great. Energy was great. You played the whole show. Yeah, power was great. No mistakes. All the all the correct things that that you know Chuck and Alex and Jizzy Pearl are used to hearing um, that the sub drummers I got over the summer just didn't get. Uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Well, talk about the decision to go public with this because you. How long had you been known? How long had you known and been dealing with it before? Because I started getting calls to this show that people went to see Quiet Riot mm-hmm. and St. Frankie wasn't there. Right. And I figured, okay, there's a conflict. Or quite honestly, I figured maybe Frankie's trying to pull like the foreigner Mick Jones deal where right. he just you know, doesn't want to go out to every show and he's going to get somebody else and give them its blessings and whatever. And then, of course, the news came out that you were battling pancreatic cancer. Mm-hmm. That dis- How long had you been dealing with it before going public with it? Over three months. Over three months. Yeah, what happened, I was diagnosed. The, the series of events is um, I was going to play a couple of songs with Alex's side project, Hookers and Blow, mm-hmm. um, for the Rainbow Parking Lot gig. Um, and and this was in uh, in April. So... I went to my storage unit to get some supplies. And while I was there, all of a sudden my calf was in a ridiculous amount of pain. I couldn't figure it out on my right foot. And I, and I got to drive back home. So I barely made it the drive back home. It was that painful. The first symptom was in your calf, you yeah, said? Yeah, in my calf. So what happened is, um, you know, my wife you know, suggested I get in touch with Kaiser. I couldn't get an appointment for a couple of days. <clears throat> and, it's a, a hospital here. Yes. Okay. And the next morning, I got up and I and I walked ten feet and and I couldn't go any further and I was out of breath and I was really weak. So um, Regina, and rightfully so, insisted that I go to emergency. So I went to emergency, um, and they did an ultrasound of my right calf and they did a scan of my upper, and uh, and what it showed was that I had a blood clot in my right calf. Blood clot, blood clot in my left lung, right lung, and in the saddle in between the two lungs. The concern was if, if they dislodge, they only take two routes. One to your brain, aneurysm, end of story. The other one to your heart, heart attack, end of story. A byproduct of the scan caught a little bit of my liver, and they saw something that didn't look right. So now this is 3.30 in the morning. I'm still at ER, um, and and they wheel me back into the scan, they scan the lower. Uh, and about an hour later, about 4.30 in the morning, the, um, 
the floor surgeon or the floor doctor in emergency comes in and unceremoniously says, uh, you have stage four pancreatic cancer that is metastasized to your liver. Uh, and I really like your music. And he signed off on the paperwork and walked out. Oh, my God. Talk about bedside manner, huh? Yeah, that's how I found out. So my my first concern was, you know, how do I call? I don't want to wake. I had sent Regina home about one thirty in the morning because she had been with me all day. Uh, so my first concern is, how do I tell my wife? My second concern is, how do I take care of Quiet Riot? So I decided not to go public at that point because... I don't want to, at that point, all I knew is that I had, you know, what they consider terminal cancer. Uh, and they gave me six months, which initially meant that the middle of October, I would probably have died. So I didn't want to go public. As in a month ago. Yeah. So I didn't want to go public with just bad news. So my first consideration was, okay, well, let's see where this goes, because I'm refusing to accept that I'm going to be dying in, in, you know, six months even though I started, you know, making arrangements just in the event, because you don't know, but I I refuse to accept it. Uh, My second consideration is, uh, and this is now April, I actually, after I was diagnosed, I flew to Florida and did a festival date with Quiet Riot, you know, against my doctor's orders, because of flying and the altitude and the blood clots. And then in May, I did um, the M3 festival on May 5th. Uh, but after that, it just became impossible to travel. So now we're going into the summer months and, you know, quiet ride ahead of full calendar. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I can't go, but how do I take care of my guys? You know, they all have expenses, they have families sure, and work. everything. Right. So I got in touch with my agent, Mark Hyman at ATI, and, uh, and you know, we discussed um, having the band go out with substitute drummers. Um, there were um, some promoters that, you know, were concerned that I had to talk off the ledge. We only lost two shows <clears throat> with the... Were those promoters aware of why, or did you just say you couldn't play the date? No, initially they, they, they were not aware of why, because no matter how much you say, you know, this is private information, right. you know, it's going to be, it's, it's the internet, it's going to be out there. Um, but by and large, we were able to talk the rest of them off the ledge. Um, there was one promoter that, that's a, a, a long time friend for about 30 years that he's the one that put on the, um, the heavy Montreal festival mm-hmm. and, and I was straight up front, you know, with him. And- the reason why I ask that mm-hmm. question is because if you're a promoter and you're told Frankie Benali can't play just, well, he just doesn't want to show up or right. because he's battling cancer. Right. I, I think I would think there'd be a different, uh, approach, you know, different, oh, Let's try to help out here. Let's take mm-hmm. the date. Frankie, get better. Send us who your sub is. Let's go. Sure. Versus, you know, if, the, if somebody's just, ah, you know, because you know there's a lot of that out there now with a lot yeah. of bands that just, it's just guys not showing up or they don't want to do it. They want to stay home and just run it. And there's a lot of that. So that's would definitely be a different, I think, uh, read on it if mm-hmm. you knew what was going on. But I also understand you not wanting to, because well, you're right, it, no matter who, it's going to get out there. Yeah, I mean, it would have been playing the, and rightfully so, the sympathy card, but the problem is that, let's say, promoter so-and-so gets off the phone and happens to say to his assistant, I mean, I can't believe this, you know, I just found out Frankie Minnelli has, you know, yeah. a really bad cancer. Yeah. Boom. Boom. Yeah. On the internet. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to avoid that. Um, but, you know, by and large, there were no issues. Um, but I'm I'm ready to go back out on the road again with Quiet Ride, and I've made that very publicly and very clear, and we already have a number of dates uh, for Quiet Ride for 2020 on the books. Well, let's talk about some of that. Uh, uh, more to talk about with Frankie Benali. Let's take a break right now. It's Eddie Trunk. We're live in Los Angeles. Frankie is here, and it's it's great to see him, and he brought me this nice bag of candy, which I'm, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm going to try. Have, uh, do you have a favorite of these? Have you had some of these? Yeah, I, I, like, I like the green tea one a lot. Um, the melon one is good. I mean, there are no bad flavors when it comes to when it comes to Japanese Kit Kats. I mean, they're they're very precise about everything they do. Are there any bad flavors when it comes to Eddie candy? Anything bad for you, Frankie? Really? No. <laughs> Not at all. It's I'm good gonna, for the soul. Uh, I'm going to try one of these things during the break. I don't know what flavor this is, but we're, I'm going to have one. All right. All right. Well, the Kit Kat was delicious. <laughs> it really was. It was a dark chocolate. Is the one that I went with first. 
You know, I, I'm on the road more than I've ever been, Frankie, in the last two, three years. So I'm going to just carry this sack around with me through the airport. There you go. Whenever you need a little snack. Um, Watch out for TSA. They love Kit Kat. <laughs> TSA guy here at LAX sees me so much. Like, you're, like your doctor, he's like, hey, Eddie, I'm a big fan. I could be bringing anything through there. He just wants to talk to me. Hey, let's do a stump the trunk or whatever. He's like, well, aren't you supposed to be checking my bag, dude? This is when you know, <laughs> this is when you know you've been to, to the Kaiser Hospital. Too many times. In every hallway, I run into somebody that's either wheeled me into a room, wheeled me out from a room, or did a procedure on me. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Every oh, day. 10, 20 people. Wow. Yeah. What's the, what's the prognosis? What are the doctors telling you? How are you tolerating this chemo? I want to talk to you about other things. Sure. People have questions about what you're going through, but also about just music and Quiet Riot. So with the time, have I don't, I don't want to just... I'm sure you, you don't want to... Uh, pound away on this mm -hmm. but at the same token i think it's wonderful that you're talking about it that you've been public about it um you, you've been on online talking about yeah. it because in a lot of ways i would think if there's people out there dealing with what that are fans and mm -hmm. dealing with what you're dealing with in a way it's 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 really inspirational to see what you're able to do still and your your spirit and attitude about going after this. I think that it's I think it's wonderful. I think it's great you're public about it. Well I think it's important for people to understand that um first of all, if if they have any inclination whatsoever that the cancer is in their family, um they should really have themselves checked out. Because I have done physicals with my doctor religiously for twenty, thirty years. And nothing ever showed up. And I did my last physical in February of this year and no issues. And here comes April and I've got uh, stage four. It starts with stage one, then stage two, then stage three, stage so four. It there's came no on quick. There's no stage five. So it was it existed, but a physical didn't didn't catch it. So you really need to insist on having a CT scan. It is, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've heard about pancreatic and what it makes it so difficult is there really aren't symptoms until it gets more advanced. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. As a matter of fact, uh, a week or so before all of this started, um, I was in, in the backyard in one corner of the yard. There was all this construction material that had been dumped there by a previous owner years ago. And it was such a beautiful little area that was marred by about 250 paver stones, 10 cinder blocks, 50 or 60 bathroom tiles, and about 15 huge flagstones. And I moved all those by hand from, from one end of the yard over behind the greenhouse, you know, where, you know, stack them all nice and neat and clean them all up. So yeah, no symptoms whatsoever. None. Is there screening? Is there a proper screening for, for pancreatic cancer? I don't believe that there is. What, what I believe you can do is if you do a CT scan, uh, if there's any abnormalities, uh, especially in the pancreas, and if, and if it has moved over to any of the other organs, it's going to show up. Um, I think probably doctors and hospitals are reluctant to order it because it's expensive. But, you know, if you can afford it or if you have the insurance, do it. It's worth doing it because if I could have caught it at stage one or maybe stage two, um, it wouldn't be as severe. Stage four is considered terminal. Mm. Because my my uh, my uh, family has a history of colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So I get screened, I get colonoscopies, and I talk about it. I talked about it on TV. It's important to let people know. Like you said, we're all getting older. You got to get out there. You got to get screened. You got to get checked out. So I get my colonoscopies every two, three years. Doctor tells me to go. I go do it. Sure. My mom had leukemia. My mom was cutting the lawn, mm -hmm. pushing, you know, my mom's, you know, old school, you know, she's, you know, old Italian woman. She's, That's what you do. She's cutting the lawn. You know, I want to cut the lawn. And yeah. I was like, she got the call. She got leukemia. Yeah. And the doctor said, what are you doing right now? She said, well, I was outside cutting the lawn. He said, you're doing what? <laughs> so you're not supposed to be able to do it. But, you know, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, it, it hits you and obviously you've got to deal with it. So, so look, being honest, yeah. you're, you're dealing with the most severe thing you could be dealing with stage four at, at, a, at a cancer that is obviously extremely brutal. Yeah. You're getting chemo right now. You, you, you have a, a great spirit about you that you're fighting this thing. What, what are the doctors telling you? Is this working? Well, my oncologist um, at at a recent visit said that the that the tumor in the pancreas has shrunk some, 
So that was positive. Uh, there was no more fluid in my lungs. Um, and that there are a lot of the problems with the liver. Um, they didn't see any more except that there's two areas there that they have some concern, which is why um, just this uh, week I did another CT scan and I'm waiting for the results to come back uh, on that. Uh, my regular doctor called me up because she came in to see me after chemo one when I was still in the hospital. And I looked like death warmed over at that, at that point because the first chemo was very brutal on my system and, and she couldn't, you know, she couldn't believe it. Um, and she called me up last week because she follows all my reports that come from, from the different, um, uh, technicians and my oncologist. And she says that, that the improvements that I've made are, are nothing short of a miracle. Um, and I attest that obviously to the treatment that I'm getting, um, but also my diet, because thank God my wife, Regina got me off years ago from being a complete and total Italian carnivore, uh, to being a vegetarian. Well, re- re- that's interesting because you're saying Italian carnivore and, and, and you and I've talked about this before and you've been nice enough to say, I got to make you a nice pasta one yeah. of these days. And you know, I grew up, uh, my, my mom's Italian, a very hardcore Italian family. I grew up in a Italian liquor deli store. Mm-hmm. My vice in life as a predominantly Italian background is carbs, is sure, pasta, and sure, bread. Sure. You're saying you were a big meat guy, huh? Yeah, yeah. So the huge. brush, all the meatball, the sausage, yeah, all that? Uh, also buco, I mean, you, you know, all the way down the line. So my father was born in Sicily, and he loved to cook. Yeah. So it was authentic, and I learned from him. My mother was born in Spain, and she loved to cook. And everything is authentic, and I learned with, uh, from her. At least four times a week, we had pasta at the house when I was a kid. But with the meatball and with the, the meatballs those, and the sausage. Right, right. Yeah. So that's and, where the yeah. the carnivore aspect comes in. Yeah. And then the other three days of the week would be something Spanish, which, you know, was more carbs, rice and the beans and the fish and this, that and the other. But the thing for you was the meat. So mm-hmm. you, you knocked out you became a vegetarian when? Um, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I, I can't even remember how long ago it was because it's been that long. Um, but you know, now I use the, a lot of the uh, Beyond Meat products. So I make very believable meatballs, uh, <laughs> very believable Italian sausage sandwiches. Yeah. But do you believe that the meat, the amount of meat had some relation to getting sick? Well, I think, I think if you're Because you're saying you stopped a long time ago. Yeah, I think, well, what I'm saying is, is that I think it's helpful um, for my recovery that, that I'm not eating uh, meats and chicken or pork, you know, any fowl uh, that for the most part have all these different you know, things added to the food that they're intaking. Uh, but if the doctors healthy. told you that, I mean, everybody makes a personal decision on how they want to handle their yeah. health. But have the doctors told you that? In other words, if you... It's a plus, yes. It's a plus. It's definitely For what a you're plus. dealing with, yeah. that's a positive. Yeah, it's definitely a plus. And I think the other thing is, is having, you know, being able to assess your particular situation. Uh, and, and once I did that, um, you know, I'm very aware that, that, you know, cancer, there's no cure for it. So I know that cancer will be the death of me. The question is when? And I think uh, having a very positive attitude is very helpful. Yeah, it's okay to have your down days because I have them. You know, it's okay to be depressed about it, but it's not okay to stay there. It's more important to continue to live your life, um, not just for yourself, but for your family members and your friends. So they're not, you know, they're not sitting around getting depressed because you're depressed. Or, or going on Facebook and, uh, and having, you know, Death Watch 2019 or Death Watch 2020. Mm. So it's very important to be, uh, to be positive and realistic. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, um, I'm not a pessimistic or optimistic person. I'm a realist. I, I deal with, with facts as they're presented to me. When this news came out, mm-hmm. first person I heard about it from was Mitch LaFon, mm-hmm. who does a podcast out of Canada. And he had posted something about it and he told me about it a day before that, because he knew we were friends and all sure. that. And, uh, and then it started, like you said, the internet, boom, it, it just goes. What about the outpouring from the music community? How, how has it been? I imagine, I, mean, I know I tried to reach out to you like everybody did. It was probably overwhelming, I would think, right? Yeah, in, in, a, very, in a very good and positive way. I mean, you know, my, my text messages, uh, I mean, at one point my phone just shut down because yeah. it was just so many were coming in, private messages on Facebook, emails, um, ev- everything, all the posts on Facebook. It's, it's amazingly, I didn't expect it. 
I mean, it's amazingly wonderful and it warms my heart. Um, and the fans really lift me up to continue the fight. Uh, so, you know, although it's happening to me as one person alone, um, there's a whole lot of people out there that, uh, that want to see a positive, uh, outcome and it means the world to me. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's interesting the way you've handled this. And I think it's, it's, it's a testament to, to you that, that, that you've handled this with such dignity and such class and you are putting it out there and you are fighting it and you're taking all that love that you're getting from people and using that. But everybody does handle stuff like this in a different way. Uh, every single day, I get a, a call to this radio show asking about Eddie Van Halen. Right. And there are a million rumors out there every day about him potentially dealing with this. We just don't know. Nobody really knows. Sure. But they say nothing yeah. ever. I mean, it's in now it's in TMZ land. Now it's just to the point where people see a picture of Eddie Van Halen and it's news. Because yeah. he, he's physically, there's a photo of him. And they say nothing at all. So they've taken that route. Mm -hmm. You obviously, after dealing with it internally for a little bit, decided to take the route to go public. And that was something that you felt was the best way to handle it for you. Well, I mean, I think it was important for a couple of reasons. It was important because I received an awful lot of um, hate from from people that were going to choir riot shows and and not seeing me play uh and like all you said of, i got those calls here too yeah you know? and 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 they were they were pretty they were pretty mean spirited you know uh and i get it i understand it because they went to a choir riot show and and there's some guy playing drums it's not me well yeah so, and, and let's be honest you are the you you're the guy i yeah. mean with all respect to the other members of the band you're the guy with the history rooted in what everybody knows as the Classic Quiet Ride, the mental health era. I've been the constant since 1980. Yeah, the documentary, everything. Yeah, I mean, so yeah. I, I get it, and I never responded to it. I never lashed out or anything, um, because I knew that at some point I was going to have to go public. It was just a matter of when and how. Um, and, you know, hopefully people now, you know, and especially those that were so incredibly critical of my uh, absence, uh, I hope they now understand that, you know, I wasn't, Oh. Sitting around at home, you know, collecting the money and yeah. getting fat. Yeah. It was a complete opposite. Let's get a couple quick calls for Frankie before we have to wrap up. We could go hours here, and hopefully we'll do another round uh, when, when Frankie's schedule permits and I'm back out here. But let's say hello real quickly to uh, – let's say hello to Ricky in Maryland. Go ahead, Ricky. You're on with Frankie. Hey, Eddie. Thanks for letting me uh, get in here. Uh, Frankie, brother, I love you, man. And all the best wishes to you, your wife, Regina, your daughter – um, I've got a signed copy of your DVD here. I watch it, dude, all the time. I enjoy it just as much every time. Um, and I've seen you a whole bunch over the years with uh, all the good lineups, man. You know what I mean? And and just all the best wishes to you. And uh, I hope you beat the shit out of that crap, man. Well, thank you so much. Now, let me let me let you know that that personally, I really appreciate your support. It means a lot to me, and it gives me uh, additional strength to continue this fight. Thank you, Ricky, for the call. This is Joe in Louisiana. Hey, Joe. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'm gonna let Frankie know. I he's in my prayers every night along with his family. I kind of know what he's going through. I'm a little dumbfounded because I'm actually talking to Frankie Benali, one of my favorite all-time guys in the band. And, <laughs> and I got through to you Monday night, and you give me grief about Def Leppard, if you remember that. I gave you grief about Def Leppard? Yeah, you you, you cut me up because <laughs> I waited 30 years to see him. Oh, I was busting Never your balls because you had said you'd... Ride. You said he, he said he yeah. waited 30 years to see Def Leppard. I said they've been around since 1980. How'd you wait 30 years? I, uh, Joe, to I have Joe told me he was like 55. I go, Where, how'd you miss the boat 35 years ago? Don't feel bad. I've only it's seen him once, and that was... I've only seen him once, and that was 1983 at the Dortmund uh, Pop Rock Festival. Uh, it's the first and last time I saw them. They were really good. <laughs> Joe, thank you. I'm just moving quickly because we want to get as many people in as we have uh, as we can because I have to end right on time, of course. This is Al, who's in Jersey. Hey, Al, go ahead. Hey, Eddie, thank you, man. Hey, Frankie, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I've seen you many times over the years. Um, I just want to say that this world is not ready for you to leave it yet. If anybody can beat the odds, you can. You've uh, hurdled over many hurdles, and you got the strength, brother, man. All right? We need you uh, to stay around for a long time, all right? That's all I really wanted to say, man. I love you, bro. And uh, 
you know, fight the good fight, my friend. Well, with your support, I intend to be around uh, as long as I possibly can and uh, continue to, uh, to entertain you with my loud drumming. <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Al. We're holding you to that, Frankie. We're absolutely <laughs> holding you to that. Uh, this is Dell, who's in Pittsburgh. Hi, Dell. You're on with Frankie Benelli. Hi. What's up, guys? Hi. Um. So I got a question for you guys, and it was, what's your favorite uh, band that either opened up for you or you opened up for? Uh, it's good to see you're going strong. Um, yeah, first time caller, and I'm 15 year old. 15 years old, big rockhead. Wow. Well, new, the next the next wave, the future yep. generation, Dell in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. So, Del, Del, thank you, Dell, for the call. So, the question is your favorite band you ever opened for or that opened for you? Well, I got to be honest with you. We were fortunate enough, Quiet Ride was fortunate enough in 1983 um, to support uh, some of my favorite bands Scorpions, um, uh, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, ZZ Top. Black Sabbath, it goes on and on. And and I can tell you that across the board, um, all those bands treated us with, with a, a great level of respect and we never had any problems. And they were all great every single night. When we had in 1984, we had Whitesnake open up for us. You know, that was like the dream version of Whitesnake with John Sykes on guitar and oh, yeah. especially uh, Cozy Powell on drums. And I got to become friends with Cozy. Uh, and that was a drum lesson every night. So... In that regard, I have no regrets or no issues with any of the bands that we supported or any of the bands that supported Kawhi Ride. We've been very fortunate. This is uh, Raymond, who's in California. Hi, Raymond. Hey, how's it going? Uh, real quickly, um, I know you had done a lot of um, drum work with Wasp. Why is it that you never actually uh, joined the band? Well, the whole thing with Was started in uh, in '89. Blackie was looking for a permanent drummer, and I was busy with Choir Ride. We were working, um, actually, this is '87, '88. We're working on the fourth Choir Ride album, and I said to Blackie, "I can't join the band, but if you want me to do the record, I will." And so I did the Headless Children record, which is my favorite of the I think eight I've played, eight or nine I've played uh, with Wasp. As it turned out, when I was in Tokyo. Um, in 89, um, I decided that I wanted to put Quiet Ride on hold for a while because it simply wasn't working with that particular lineup. And Blackie, I don't know how he found out about it, but I got a call from him and he says, uh, uh, stay in Tokyo for another week, do press for the Headless Children, fly to London, and we'll start pre-production rehearsals the following week in London. And I did the world tour for Headless Children. But Blackie and I are really, really good friends. You know, we've, we've had, you know, like, like any brother, um, you know, we've had issues in the past that have all been put to rest long ago, uh, but he's great. I just was never a permanent um, uh, touring part of the band. So we got about 90 seconds before I have to end. Uh, anything that you want to say to the fans or on the air before we have to wrap up? Anything you want to mention? Yeah, please know that, you know, the volume of, of messages that I've received uh, across the board has been... Um, amazing for me. I have read them all. Um, I apologize for not being able to respond to each and every single one because there's just not enough hours in the day. Um, and I continue with my therapy both in and out of uh, hospitals and private clinics. Uh, so my main focus is to get myself um, healthy and to continue to, uh, to play drums uh, with Quiet Riot Live. I speak for all the fans. We love you. We're praying for you. I've known you for a long time, man. We go way, way, way back. We really do. And uh, I, I say with all my heart, I love you. I really do. And well, you're, and I, you're a true brother to me. Well, same here. And Thank I'm you. honored and thankful that you took the time out. I know with what you're going through to be here with me today and spend some time talking to me in the audience. And I got a lot of confidence in you, man. You're, you're a fighter. And uh, I got... I got Sending nothing but the best vibes out to you, my brother. Well, I'm right. at your service anytime you need me for anything at all. Likewise, here too. Thank know you. that. Here too. I love Frankie you, Frankie Benelli, everybody. I love you, Frankie. Thank you, buddy. All right, brother.
कैसे भूल पाए गो 